Hey everyone, welcome back to Portal of Wisdom. I'm back today with another story for you. So if you are new to the channel, like and subscribe and click that little post notification bell so you get alerted when I post new videos. And now on to today's topic. Today we are going to talk about a Spanish treasure ship. So we've all heard of Spanish treasure ships sinking to the bottom of the ocean and being rediscovered by divers who then brought up treasure back to the surface. But what if I told you there's a Spanish treasure ship somewhere in the California desert, in the Mojave Desert? So this is a pretty crazy story, so pay attention to the end so you get all the details and you understand what happened. So the story starts in the early 1600s when Spain was in control of Mexico and looking for more gold and silver and pearls and other treasures and riches in the countryside and the waters of Mexico. So in the year 1610, King Philip III of Spain ordered Captain Alvarez de Cordon to put together an expedition of the west coast of Mexico in search of pearls. So at that time, pearls were extremely valuable and western Mexico was known to have some of the most fantastic oyster beds near the west coast of Mexico. So at that time, some of the most exquisite pearls came from this area, and they were highly sought after, even more so than gold and silver. And the king of Spain wanted a large amount of them. So Captain Cordon, he put together a group of three Spanish galleon-type treasure ships and put together crews to man them on their conquest for these riches. Now, obviously, these ships did not come from Spain since they were on the west coast of Mexico. They had to be built there, and it took about two years to build these three needed ships, and then Cordon was able to leave Acapulco in July of 1612 with the three ships. So they headed north into the Gulf of California, which was known to be some of the best oyster beds in the world at that time. And they were said to have these giant oysters, huge oysters. And these oysters were known to produce exquisite pearls, especially black pearls and various other colors, creamy rose-colored pearls that were just very hard to find and very rare to find some of the quality of pearls that were found in these oyster beds. So these beds, not only did they produce these highly desired pearls, but uh, there were a lot of tribes that lived along these waters that also fished these waters and, and also dived into these waters. So as the Three ships proceeded north up the coast. Cordon and his men noticed that some of the natives from some of these villages, they seemed to be diving for oysters. So Cordon sent some of his men to shore in a rowboat to talk to the natives about their oyster diving. So his men had discovered that these natives, they were diving for oysters and some other things, but... They were surprised to learn that they were doing so basically to eat the oysters and, you know, other seafoods and stuff they were bringing up. So if they encountered any pearls, they just put them in these big clay jars. And they had many clay jars full of beautiful pearls that they really had not much use for. They used them a little bit for jewelry and stuff, but... The natives had such huge quantities of them that they really couldn't use or didn't need, so they just stored them away and they continued to build up. But the natives really loved the Spanish uniforms and the clothes worn by the Spaniards, especially the officers' and the captains' uniforms. So this gave Cordon an idea, and he made a deal with the natives. So he said that he would trade the natives some Spanish uniforms and clothes for their massive amounts of pearls. And the natives agreed they didn't have much need for most of these pearls. And that evening, 
they took a rowboat back to the ship and and they started to arrange bundles of clothes to trade the next morning. So they did this on all the different ships, all three ships. So the next morning, they came ashore in a few rowboats again and they had bundles of clothes and they exchanged these clothes for about two dozen clay jars full of pearls, which they quickly loaded onto the rowboats and they headed quickly back to their ships that were anchored in the shallows. So the Spaniards loaded all of these jars of pearls onto the ships as the natives opened these bundles of clothes on the beach and as they opened them they discovered that they were not these nice uniforms and fancy clothes but they were instead tattered ragged worn out clothes that the Spaniards basically wanted to discard anyhow. So the natives became enraged and they were jumping up and down on the beach and they started firing arrows at the ships and then they got in canoes and they started rowing out towards the ships and continuing to shoot arrows at the ships and at the people on the ships. And Captain Cordon unfortunately had been hit in the chest with an arrow. So the ship's doctor at this point, he was worried that Cordon would not survive if he was not brought back to Acapulco immediately for better treatment. So Cordon headed south was hit with his ship to Acapulco, but he sent the other two ships to continue north. So those two ships were captained by Captain Rosales and Captain Iturbe. So these captains, they continued north and they were sending their divers into the waters and they were collecting a lot more pearls on the journey north into the Gulf of California and up the Gulf of California, which is also known as the Sea of Cortez. So as you go north, the Gulf of, Gulf of California, it eventually ends at the delta of the Colorado River, which pours into the sea at this point. And back in those days, before you had Hoover Dam and Glen Canyon Dam, and uh, you know, before the Colorado River was controlled, it was a pretty wide area for the Colorado River Delta, probably making it pretty difficult to determine where the Gulf of California ended and the Colorado River Delta began and the river began. So when they were in this area of the northern part of the far northern part of the Gulf, Rosales's ship hit a reef and it started taking on water. So they then had to offload all of his pearls and his men and all his supplies onto a turbe ship. So now Captain Aturbe's ship was riding very low in the water from all the added weight. But Aturbe was not ready to turn back and head back toward Acapulco yet. He wanted to sail on and keep looking for more pearls. So at some point they were no longer on the Gulf of California and had entered the large delta of the Colorado River. So it may have been hard for them to tell exactly where the river delta started and, you know, where the Gulf of California ended. But it used to be very wide back in those days. So also do not forget, this is late summertime at this point, and this is the middle of monsoon season. So most likely the river was even fuller than normal with no flood control back then and no dams holding back large amounts of water. So a turbe, he sailed approximately 60 miles up the Colorado River and found it opened up into another sea. So at this point, it seems he didn't really realize that he was really no longer on the ocean and he was on fresh water. So as he sailed around the edges of this large inland sea, we're talking monstrous inland sea, he sailed around the edges and he didn't find any more oyster beds. And of course he didn't because they weren't on the ocean or they weren't in salt water anymore. But as he sailed around this inland sea to look, and like I said, it was huge, and it was most likely this huge seasonal basin that filled with flood water during the rainy season and the flooding of the Colorado River. This inland sea was 
most likely where the Salton Sea sits to today, but much larger than that. And it sounds like experts believe that that is the area that used to flood and make this huge inland sea that was from pretty much just south of Palm Springs all the way down to Mexicali, huge. So as they're sailing around this sea and sailing around the edges, they basically make it back in a few days back to the point where they had entered this inland sea and they discovered at this point that there was no channel anymore to get back into the main part of the river. So they were now in a separated inland sea. So with no connecting waterway connecting to the river, they continued to sail around the edges and look for another exit from this sea or this lake that they were in. And while they're doing this and taking days to do this, the waters are gradually receding back into the desert. So finally the waters had receded enough that they finally ran aground. And the ship, because it was so loaded down with weight, it did immediately begin or begin to list or lean on its side. So the waters quickly disappeared and they left the men in this desert. So at this point, they knew they couldn't stay here and they grabbed whatever food, water, and supplies that they could and they had to abandon ship, leaving the valuable cargo behind. So they knew that they needed to try to walk towards the villages on the coast of Mexico and hope to make it back to Acapulco. So on their journey, some of the men succumbed to starvation and dehydration and Native American attacks, but a few of them did make it back to tell the story. So the ship sat in the Mojave Desert for a good 250 years or more at the mercy of the weather. And the shifting sands of the Mojave Desert had swallowed up the ship under the sand dunes, but as they shifted, parts of the ship would be visible at times. And, and first mentions of this ship in the desert came from people traveling to California after the Civil War. So there would be a mention now and then in the saloons about a ship that someone saw that was half buried in the desert sands that they happened to spot on their way to the California gold fields or just out to the California coast. So people in the towns west of the desert, they would hear these stories here and there of this ship half buried under the sand dunes and, and they wouldn't think too much of it. So one gentleman, though, he had mentioned that he camped next to it or possibly inside of it, and he had mentioned it was full of sand. And in 1892, a group of prospectors that were prospecting the desert mountains not far from there, they were in an area that they said was about 18 miles southwest of the southern tip of the Salton Sea. And one of the party spotted a long wooden pole on the desert floor. And they thought it looked out of place. And then one of the prospectors said that it actually was a ship's mast. And they wondered how it got there. So the area had lots of sand dunes and just never ending sand dunes. So most likely the ship was under one of them near the mast. But as everyone that ran across the ship, they never really knew the story until much later if they ever learned the story at all. So those that tried to retrace their steps once they found out about the story were always unsuccessful. They just weren't able to find it because, you know, when you have thousands upon thousands of sand dunes and it could be under one of them, it's near impossible to find it. So, and this area does have nonstop sand dunes that seem to go on for miles and miles and every dune can look the same. So it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. There are a lot of places in this area too, though, where people do ride their quads up and down the dunes. There's a lot of these areas. This is a, uh, a heavily 
used area for quads going up and down the dunes. So maybe someday a lucky quad rider will find it. But in 1915, an elderly Native American from the Yuma tribe, he walked into a little store in Indio, California, and he tried to use a handful of stones to pay for some goods. So the store owner then realized that they were actually pearls, and they were very exquisite ones at that. So the store owner then asked him how he came to have these pearls, and he said he came through the desert some 60 miles away, and he came across a strangely built wooden house, mostly covered by sand and abandoned. But he said inside there were many casks of these rose and cream colored stones so he helped himself to a few and he made his way towards indio so the storekeeper and a few other townspeople asked the native man if he would lead them to this unusual house in the desert and he agreed and he took payment from the group and they put the native man up at one of their houses to stay for the the night and the next morning, they were all going to meet at this gentleman's house and going to go on their excursion. Well, the next morning, when the men were all ready for their trip into the desert, and they came over to the man's house where the Native American man had stayed, they discovered that this Native Yuma man was nowhere to be found. He had disappeared on them. As recently as 1999... Backpackers and trail riders have told stories of seeing the bow or stern of an old sailing vessel sticking out of the sand. So the location though is so remote and there's really no landmarks making it nearly impossible to trace your steps in a sea of sand dunes. And back in those days the Colorado River did in really extreme cases it did flood this area but uh it doesn't it doesn't do that anymore so um being controlled by dams and and a lot of flood control so we can't really trace exactly how big the the sea may have been and the winds have shifted the sand dunes so much now that it's it's difficult to tell the exact boundaries of what would have been this great inland sea but apparently there is still a treasure ship full of pearls somewhere under a sand dune in southern california's mojave desert so there may be another chapter to this story in june of 2009 the san diego reader published an article titled stay away from pinto canyon and it was a story of a hike into a very remote canyon west of El Centro, California, called Pinto Canyon. And this canyon has old Native American pictographs or rock art. And the unusual thing about these pictographs is that they seem to show an old Spanish sailing ship with square sails. So it's a very unusual site, and nothing else like this had ever been found before. So this group had gone into this canyon and they told the story to experts after they had come out of this canyon and explained what they had seen there. And it was experts at the Maritime Museum in San Diego that they were recounting this story to. And these experts were extremely excited and really wanted to go check this location out. So they eventually arranged for this group to be taken out to the site so they could see for themselves. So could this Native American rock art be depicting Captain Juan de Aturbe's pearl ship? They were curious. So a few days later, once the trip was arranged, they all met in Ocotillo, California, and then took a jeep road into Davies Valley and got within two miles of Pinto Canyon. And there they encountered a steel gate that had blocked access to the road now, and it was locked. So apparently the BLM had just erected it to stop drug smugglers who had been using this route to smuggle drugs from Mexico and they wanted it to be a little more difficult for them to use these back roads. 
So these people, they went home and they started the process of getting through the red tape to get access into this area now that in the last week or two it had been even locked down a little tighter. So the area was actually owned by the BLM and uh, military bombing range was like right next door too. So it took the museum president to kind of navigate this federal system and red tape to get access for his team of archaeologists, historians, photographers, and site managers. And they finally returned to the site under the protection of armed federal agents. So once on site and viewing these, these petroglyphs, the experts said that the ship depicted was most definitely a Spanish sailing ship. So it couldn't be determined if the depiction was showing the 1539 expedition of Francisco Ayola or the 1602 expedition of Sebastian Vizquiano or the 1542 Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo expedition or the ill-fated Juan de Iturbe expedition. The significance of Juan de Iturbe's expedition is that it is located somewhere in the neighborhood of only about six miles away from Pinto Canyon where the Aturbe ship is believed to be. So it seems it could quite possibly be a depiction of his ship, especially so since it seems that it was probably abandoned there for you know many years that the natives may have seen it before the sands eventually swallowed it up. So from all the accounts of quad riders and off-road riders seeing it through the years or parts of the, stip, the ship sticking out of the sand dunes, its approximate location has been mapped. One of these people named Ed Barf, he provided a precise location and he said the ship lies just 300 feet southeast of the easternmost edge of the Superstition Mountains. So a lot of that area is designated for off-road vehicle use, but the ship's remains are actually currently located in an area reserved as a bombing range under the jurisdiction of the El Centro Naval Air Facility. So it seems many people have reached out to them to get access, but as of late, they either don't respond or don't allow access so the writer of the article stated that he had seen articles lately in the Imperial Valley Press with titles like Navy Says Stay Away From Bombing Range. So it seems that they do not want access to the site or don't want anyone going on site where the ship is believed to be. It also appears that the pictograph site could be under a different jurisdiction the way that the article is written and, and how the access there was done through the BLM. So that is the story of Juan de Aturbe's ill-fated expedition into the Colorado River and the Great Lake that used to exist there after some good summer floods and the pearls that are probably still on board and the ship may be under a Mojave Desert sand dune somewhere in this area. If you have any thoughts or comments, definitely leave them in the comments section.